humble prayer. The Bible message and which is the gospel message that we old Baptists, primitive Baptists, original Baptists, trying to follow the rule and faith and practice of the New Testament church as set forth by the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, and given first unto the apostles, that the Lord gave first unto the church apostles, that message of free and sovereign grace. For it is that message, it is that truth, but it's the message of that truth, it is the message, it is the word of reconciliation that Jesus preached that he gave to the apostles to preach. It is the message that gives God all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory for every individual that will land safe and secure on the sunny banks of sweet deliverance. That message of free and sovereign grace ascribes and it gives all the praise, all the glory. It excludes the boasting of man. Yeah. It excludes the works of man as far as eternal deliverance is concerned from everlasting woe and misery. So we thank God this morning for that message. And I'd like to endeavor to try to speak to you a while this morning on why the message of free and sovereign grace is the truth and why it is so important not only for the salvation of God's people, but it's the Bible message. And it is the only message that gives God all the praise, honor, and glory. I'm going to turn to begin with this morning. And I'm going to read the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 31, and this verse is at the end of this chapter. We're in the last part of this chapter. The Apostle Paul has been writing concerning these things that leads up to verse 31. Now, the Lord willing, I'd like to get some of those things, but before we do, as after I read verse 31, then I want to go back and catch a couple of Old Testament scriptures because... In verse 31 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says that according as it is written. Now we'll look in just a moment where it's written. But here is the quote. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. In the Lord. This is taken from expression in the Old Testament. It is taken primarily from two verses that is found in Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9 in verse 23 and verse 24. Now I want you to notice what, what it says here. If you'll notice... The Lord's example of preaching and the example of the apostles preaching, they preached the scriptures. Yeah. That's exactly what they did. Many times Jesus would refer and say, as it is written, or it is written. Jesus would make uh, references to Old Testament scriptures, Old Testament texts in the law and in the prophets. The apostles preached uh, from the uh, law and the prophets, from the Psalms, from the Old Testament, they brought forth and preached. They preached from the Scriptures. They took text, if you please. And we see that example that is set forth. And as the Apostle Paul is preaching, and you've heard me say this, the Apostle Paul, he wrote what he preached, and he preached what he wrote. And he said, it's written. 
Let him that glorieth glory in the Lord. Here, here in, in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Now here is three examples that are set forth. Here is three categories that is, that is placed before that, that uh, covers the spectrum uh, whereby you can apply the principle to every circumstance and situation. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But, but, let him that glorieth glory in this. Now, the synonym for glorieth and to get to the very heart of the matter is to, to boast to speak of, to give reference to. But let him that glorieth, glory in this, let him that boasteth, let him that boasteth or, or speaks of in, in, in this sense. In other words, the wise man is not to boast in his uh, wisdom. The mighty man is not to boast not to speak of as though it is in and of him, of his might. And far as the one having uh, riches, he's not to put his trust there or boast in them, but his glory, his boasting, his bragging should be on the Lord. Yeah. This is what the Apostle Paul is teaching, that we should, amen, glorious. We should boast, we should brag on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. If, if we do good works of faith, if we are uh, enabled through knowledge of the Scripture and by the, the power of the Spirit of the Lord working in us, the Apostle said in one expression uh, that he labored more abundantly than they all, but yet not I, but Christ that is in me. He, he gave the glory. He gave the boasting he gave the bragging on Jesus. It wasn't of his power. The power source wasn't in him. And brothers and sisters, the power source is not in us. The power source, amen, is God. And it is from God, our ability. And it goes right back to the expression and, and to the message we tried to preach on that our sufficiency. It wasn't of his power. The power source wasn't in him. Brothers and sisters, the power source is not in us. The power source, amen, is God. And it is from God, our ability. And it goes right back to the expression and, and to the message we tried to preach on that our sufficiency is of God. That's where our sufficiency comes from. Therefore, we have nothing to boast of in and of ourselves. But our boasting, our bragging, our glory, our ascribing praise, it all goes to the Lord. And, and the doctrine that we preach is the only doctrine, and it's the Bible doctrine, that ascribes the glory unto God. That does the bragging on God. For you see, if there was one little iota, in comparison, if there was one little penny's worth that man does as far as securing or enabling or helping God in his eternal destination that will never end, then it would not be all of free and sovereign grace. God would not be the only being in heaven that, that the reason for his people being there, if there was a penny's worth that anyone could do, then God would not be ascribed all the honor, praise, and glory for housing his people in heaven in immortal glory without the loss of one. Now I need you to listen to me real close and for you to get this right here that I'm about to say and to give this example. If all the money in the world was housed here in this building, all the money in the world was housed 
right here in this building and all the doors were locked. But yet if you had a penny and, and it was said that with one penny you, it would open the door and give you access to all the money in the world. But see, here's the problem with it. You don't have a penny because all the money in the world is in this building. Therefore, you don't have the penny. <laughs> you see, that's the thing with man. Man don't have the penny. Man don't have the ability. Man don't have what it takes. A man does not have anything for it. For in the flesh, we cannot please God. We can't do a penny's worth of good uh, to please God, to move ourselves across the line, to get us from where we are by nature, to move us toward God. He that is in the flesh, uh, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. And that's that expression there in Romans is talking about totally in, in, uh, in the Adamic nature. In other words, uh, never born of the Spirit of God. God, uh, in the flesh, in that carnal nature uh, fully, cannot do one penny's worth in order to please God. Therefore, we don't have the penny to get the door open to get the access to all the money in the world because the penny's not out there. It's in here. Amen. Everything is in God. All our sufficiency is in and of Him. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Here's what we should glory in. Here's what we should praise in. Here is what we should speak of. The understanding and knowing of the Lord. Oh, and the only reason that we have that understanding and knowing Him is because He has first taught us in the heart and then He has given uh, us uh, the desire and the ability through the Scriptures uh, and, and Him enlightening and illuminating our eyes that we can see the glorious truth of free and sovereign salvation and to have come to that conclusion Salvation is of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Salvation is of the Lord. That's what it all boils right down to. That salvation is of the Lord. He says that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Amen. The Lord delights in the exercise of His loving kindness, in His judgment, His justice, meeting out righteous just, justice uh, and, and righteousness, His right doing in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So uh, the Apostle Paul, when he uses that expression there in 1 Corinthians 1 and 31 and says, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now one more. There in Isaiah chapter 42 and in verse 8. Notice this now. Notice this language. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to graven image. God is free with his grace. But he is tight. He reserves his glory. <laughs> Amen. God will not share his glory. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. God is not pleased with anyone that it endeavors uh, to take. God does not give. Therefore, an individual would have to take when they exercise 
in boasting, when they exercise in glorying in something that they did or do, and the gospel message that teaches man a work system that man is to do something in order to be saved in heaven and immortal glory is endeavoring to take something that God is not giving. Don't you notice that? He said, I will not give to another concerning his glory. My glory will I not give to another. God reserves his glory unto himself. God does not mete out his glory. He meets out his grace. He gives eternal life. Oh, he gives eternal life. Oh, uh, uh, this is what Jesus said there in that priestly prayer in John chapter 17 when he's praying to his father and says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh. Jesus is speaking of himself that that's what the Father has done, that the Father has given him power over all flesh to do what? To give eternal life, not for man to take it in, in a penny's worth. And not even a penny's worth. Not, not doing one thing. <laughs> oh, for we don't have one fathering. We don't have one cent to pay the debt. I tell you, Jesus, it took uh, he, he, Jesus ransoming. He had to pay the ransom. Uh, he had to redeem. He had to purchase back. I tell you, in order to ransom something, you once had to have it. You know, if you had a real nice a uh, family heirloom, uh, uh, say a gold pocket watch, uh, and and you t and you took it to the pawn shop and you pawned it. Uh, uh, you, it wouldn't be, no one else could go down there and redeem it. Someone else could go down there and, and buy it. They could purchase it uh, after the contract was over uh, and it was legal for the, the pawn shop to sell it. But the only person uh, that uh, could redeem it would be the one that owned it. Yeah. All right. Amen. The one that had possession of it. You say, well, Brother David, who sold it? I tell you, amen, Adam sold us out. Adam sold us out under the law of sin and death. For by one man, sin entered into the world. And so death passed upon all men. Adam sold us out. Amen. So therefore, Jesus came to redeem. He came to ransom. He ransomed with blood, with the precious blood of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I, I really like those words that's over. You find in 1 Peter, there in chapter 1. Uh, when we move over just a little bit on, over in that chapter... In verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 1, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, Amen. This precious Lamb of God, as John saw him uh, walking there and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. Oh, a definite, particular world under consideration. Amen. The world of his people consisting of Jews and Gentiles elect, those chosen and treasured in Christ Jesus, this spotless, precious a Lamb of God that gave his life, that breathed out his blast and said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit that he gave up the ghost, that he accomplished his death. Thank God we are ransomed with blood. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why that last expression in verse 5 of the Revelation in verse 5, chapter 1, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins 
in his own blood. Amen. That's the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost that his people in the new birth are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God for his shed blood, meaning his death, that he bore our sins in his own body on the tree of the cross that Jesus, he himself, did all of this, that he himself bought and purchased, redeemed his people with eternal redemption. Oh, for redemption was purposed even before the foundation of the world, before there ever was a sinner There was a Savior purposed. Amen. There was a divine purpose. There was a scheme. Oh, uh, that was so designed uh, in the triune God whereby, amen, it has always been uh, that God is pleased to save a people. And it's because uh, even so it seemed good in thy sight, O Lord. Oh, I tell you, uh, his purposes uh, is that which seems good in his sight. In his eyes, all of his purposes. Now I want to go back here to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We want to go back. I invite you to read all the verses before in this chapter. But for the sake of time, we're going to start in verse 22. Where he says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Man, Paul is is writing and he is saying uh, that those... uh, Uh, that are without and have not been called. Uh, uh, With the Jews, uh, they require a sign. Uh, With the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. But in preaching Christ crucified is to the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks it is foolishness. But it takes those Jews and Gentiles, amen, of God's people that have been effectually called by the life-giving voice of the Son of God uh, to understand, to have an interest, to embrace uh, this wonderful truth as it is in Christ, uh, to be able to have this illumination. He says in verse 25, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Oh, I'm so thankful this morning that it did not say uh, not any. It said how that not many. It didn't say Uh, how that uh, uh, not any are called. Thank God we know and understand and we see some prominent uh, uh, monarchs. We see some rich men. Uh, We see some mighty men through the scriptures that were called. But far and large, uh, we see as the apostle is stating here, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. You know, it was the common people that heard him gladly. Uh, uh, The main of God's people are those uh, that are more so that the aristocrats and uh, the elite uh, so called of this world uh, uh, who are high and fancy in the, uh, the wisdom and trusting in the wisdom and the mind and the riches of this world. Oh, uh, we don't uh, uh, see those uh, uh, among the number, uh, but we see those uh, that are poor in spirit. We see those uh, uh, that are merciful. Uh, We see those uh, uh, that uh, 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 don't have uh, a lot as far as the, uh, the, the thinking of this world goes and is and concerned. This is what the apostle is uh, uh, setting forth here. 
but God have chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God have chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen yea and things which are not to bring to naught things that are why and the wise and God have chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen yea and things which are not to bring to naught things that are why why you know I'm, I'm glad that the, the spirit goes on and blesses the apostle Paul to be able to write and to give us the answer to that why. Yeah. Why do these things that we've just read, why? That no flesh should glory yeah. in his presence. Right. No flesh should glory in his presence. Oh, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to notice this now. He's going to help us to understand of this message of God's sovereignty and the salvation of his people, the salva- the, his sovereignty in election, his sovereignty in, in choice, sovereign choice of God. For we know and understand that all, the, all of the, uh, the election and the polls were closed before the foundation of the world. Amen. God is the only one that voted. Amen. God is the only one. Uh, that chose. We see and understand that. This is the message of free and sovereign grace that is all of him. It's in him and by him. And the apostle uh, goes on after he says that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Of him are you in Christ Jesus. In other words, the only reason that you and I hope me that are in Christ Jesus is because of God. That's exactly what that expression is saying. But of Him. But of God. You see, uh, we understand the Him there in 30. God. But of Him are ye in Christ. Of God the Father are ye in Christ Jesus. Who of God there, and here again, God, God's done something for the ones that are in Him. It's, it's, it's all in God that God's people are in Christ. You know, when we, when we read and understand there in the Ephesian letter, in chapter, in chapter 1 of the Ephesian letter, when we, when we hear the apostle saying in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about now God the Father. God, the same one that is is under consideration uh, there in verse 30 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Of, Of Him are ye in Christ. It's God the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. God has blessed us with these heavenly blessings, these blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him. In him. It's because of God the Father that we're in Christ, that we were chosen, that we were placed in Christ. And when did it happen? When, when did the, the election, when did the choice, when, did, when was the vote cast, when was the polls closed? Before the foundation of the world. Yeah. You know this thing, you know God cast a vote and the devil cast a vote and you, you, you cast a vote and, and break the tie either for God or the devil. That's nonsense. There's no Bible to that whatsoever. I believe what I'm preaching this morning is the Bible. I believe it's the doctrine of the old church. I believe it's the doctrine of Christ. It's the doctrine of the apostles. 
And as uh, uh, the Apostle Paul speaks in the Hebrew letter uh, and says, God, it, who in sundry times and in divers manners spake unto the fathers uh, uh, in time past has spoken in these last days, have spoken unto us by his Son. Oh, uh, uh, the Son of God uh, spoke and preached uh, uh, his gospel uh, and taught his apostles uh, uh, and uh, the apostles uh, gave it unto the church and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the apostles' teaching. And here, the, as the apostle Paul writes to the, to the brethren, to the church uh, at Ephesus, the saints, to the saints which are at Ephesus. Uh, these are one uh, in, in, the, in saints, uh, those that's under consideration that we're talking about this morning and those uh, that uh, not only have imputed righteousness and imputed holiness, uh, for that's the only holiness and only righteousness required for heaven and immortal glory is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their sins unto them. Amen. Our sins are no longer counted, imputed, or counted against us. They were put to the Lord's account. And he paid that. He was made to be sin. Oh, yes, he was made to be sin. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree of the cross. And why was he made to be sin that we could be made of the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Uh, for we see that Adam, by his disobedience, uh, he made many sinners. Uh, it was by that disobedience that many were made sinners. Uh, even so, by the obedience of one, many are made righteous. <laughs> Oh, that all goes together hand in hand. Uh, what the expression is teaching us. So these, these saints here, uh, first and foremost, by the imputed holiness and the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, for, for saints here uh, expressing holy ones, and the only reason that we can have any experiential holiness uh, and be ye holy even as he is holy. In other words, uh, uh, to follow after his teachings, to walk in a way of righteousness uh, is that he has first uh, worked it in us. That he has worked it in us. So this is who he's writing to. He's writing to disciples. He's writing to followers of Christ. Those that have been uh, made legally holy and righteous and, in, and are endeavoring uh, to walk by the grace of God in a way of holiness and righteousness. All right. So uh, when he says, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's legally, in a legal sense. Why? Because the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Well, I tell you, that's the, that's the only way, amen, that God looks upon us is that he sees us through his son. That's the only reason. Well, because of that imputed holiness, imputed righteousness, uh, that God's uh, uh, people, his chosen ones, those that he chose in Christ, uh, those that the apostle uh, uh, says uh, that but of, but of him are ye in Christ. That's why no flesh uh, can glory in his presence. Uh, that's why because no flesh, no individual has a penny's worth uh, to help themselves, uh, to help God, to get to God, or to call on God, uh, or, to, or to move toward God. One dead and trespass in sin cannot move toward God. God has to come to us. God has to come to us in that state that we're in by nature. He has to do that for us and place us vitally. Well, you see, you see, in God's purpose, in, in God's purpose, this is what the apostle is speaking of uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, whereby that, that God... Uh, purpose that in this choosing, in this election, uh, chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Uh, this covenant of grace, 
that was made between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost before the foundation of the world where God purposed to save a people and Jesus agreed. The Son of God uh, to be made, uh, to be manifest, the Word made flesh and condescend and bow and stoop and come down to earth in the person of Jesus Christ and to walk here and to live a perfect life, never a bad thought, never a bad word out of his mouth, a perfect man uh, that kept the law of God and fulfilled it to the very jot and to the tittle. Oh, for you see, brothers and sisters, we know that if we're guilty of the least, we're guilty of the whole. Uh, so it took Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, uh, to live it. One expression of Scripture says we're saved by his life. Amen. Well, that's how we're saved by his life. You said, I thought we were saved by his death. It's both of them. Amen. We're saved by his life that he lived a perfect life. Amen. Uh, that he did what we could not do. He lived it. Amen. <laughs> he lived it. You know, uh, you hear those of a work system say, uh, well, you got to get right with God. I want to tell you, thank the Lord, we had one that was right with God. We had one, amen, that walked here. He was right. Amen. He was right of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was right in our room instead. And he died in our room instead to purchase us, to redeem us, to be our redeemer kinsman. Uh, 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 to pay uh, that that we had nothing whatsoever uh, to pay with. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God yeah. is made unto us. Yeah. Oh, now, because of God, that we're in him, in it, as far as from a, a purpose standpoint, from a legal standpoint, and from a vital standpoint, it's all in the Godhead. It's all in the triune God. And God, just like uh, because of his obedience, uh, because even so by the obedience of one, many were made righteous. Well, I tell you, God also made Jesus something. He made him something unto us. What did God make him unto us? He made him unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. These four things, oh, uh, it, it, it sums it up. Uh, it, it's everything that is needed. It's everything that's involved in order uh, to house the elect, the chosen uh, of God, the Lord's people in heaven in immortal glory without the loss of one because God made Christ unto us. He made him unto us. It's imputed unto us what he was, his wisdom, his righteousness, his sanctification and redemption. Yeah. Oh, that he did it. That, there's, notice that word leading into that verse 31. That, that, laying hold on verse 30. And laying hold on the next expression in verse 31, that word that. The word that reaches back and it reaches forward. All right? I want you to get that picture in your mind. That, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Yeah. Now I want you to also to notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we're not only from a purpose point, from a legal point, but in a vital, from a vital standpoint, we are in Christ. It is of Him that we are in Christ. Every, from every point, from every angle, from every uh, uh, position, <laughs> That we are in Christ, it is of God the Father. And this is here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with 17. Here it is from a vital, from 
the, the regeneration from the new birth, if you please. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All of these things involving and concerning around uh, the eternal salvation of God's people. And all things are of God. Now notice that next expression. And all things are of God. That's, that's the same way that he said in the first letter there in chapter 1 and verse 30 that it's of him that we're in Christ and all things are of God. He's saying the same thing with just some different words. He's preaching the same message just, just with different words of expression. Oh, you see, the, the, the more ways of expressing, it helps us to get more of the point, more understanding and more witness to the truth that is being expressed, to the truth that God is delivering by the Spirit unto us. And all things are of God. This is not all things without exception. We know sin is not of God. That's not what he's talking about. When it says in all things are of God, it ties right back into verse 17. It ties right back into the context that we are under. It's just like how that God, how that people snatch out what the Lord uh, said, by the Spirit said uh, to the Apostle Paul, and he wrote uh, and preached it to, there in the Roman letter uh, that we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called according uh, to uh, his purpose. Uh, uh, just take it right out of context uh, and say it's, it's all things without exception. No, he gives us those things. He goes on and tells us those things. And after he tells us them five things uh, of uh, uh, foreknow, uh, predestinate, uh, called, justified, glorified, then he says, and what shall we say to these things? He, he talks about the things there above it and then he goes right back to things below it. Stay in the context. And that's what this expression in verse 18, and all things are of God. What we just read in verse 17 where it said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I tell you, what is passed away uh, is the uh, implication, the, uh, imputing as far as the, the law and the, uh, the, the illegalness of it. It was done at Calvary, uh, but, the, but the vitalness of it, the actuality of it, uh, removing us out from under the law of sin and death uh, and uh, doing that quickening, and ye hath he uh, quickened, and ye hath he uh, quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. And we know that that is actually done at the time of regeneration, and that's what's under context. And now uh, there's uh, the things new of the Spirit. There's that vital relationship. There is Christ in you, the hope of glory now. A new creature in Christ. There's something new there. All right, that wasn't there before. Now the old nature's still there, but the consequences and the, the penalty and living under the, under the bondage of sin is not there now. Amen. Under that bondage of it. Now, that don't mean that we won't sin. We, we understand that. That's, a, that's, a, that's another subject matter. Uh, you know, the, the Lord, Lord knew that we, that we sin, that we do sin. That's why he said, little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. This ain't got a thing to do with going to heaven, confessing your sins in order to go to heaven. No, it's talking about God's born again children. Uh, but we deal with our sins as he deals, as, as we come along in time, and it's Jesus Christ the righteous. And he said, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. This ain't got a thing to do with going to heaven, confessing your sins in order to go to heaven. No, it's talking about God's born-again children. 
uh, can, but we deal with our sins as he deals as, as we come along in time and as, as we uh, come along our sins in time as they're committed and the, that's that new creature in us that uh, that new uh, awakened conscious uh, unto what's right and what's wrong and that accusing and ex excusing is taking place and God deals with us of our sins uh, we're not to hide them we're not to sweep them under a rug but we're to confess them and he said if we confess them he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness yeah. I believe that's rightly dividing amen the word of truth in, in concerning that so in all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ it's God doing this God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and I believe that's going back uh, to uh, the legal work and then the vital work by the Spirit, by the life-giving voice of the Son of God. And then he says, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He hadn't given to us the work of reconciliation. He's given unto us the ministry, the word of reconciliation. That's a big difference. I'm, I'm afraid there's far too many of God's people and, and they have been over the last 2,000 years, and they still are today, that thinks that God's given them the work of reconciliation. He ain't given, he's not given anyone the work, W-O-R-K, of reconciliation. But thank God through his church, he's given gifts through the church, and out of the church he has lifted up men and called them to preach the word, W-O-R-D, the word of reconciliation. Amen. Big difference. All right. To wit, or meaning to witness that God was in Christ. God was in Christ. Doing what? Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And have committed unto us the word. See what I just told you. It's Bible. Right there it is. He's committed unto us the word, W-O-R-D, not the W-O-R-K. All right. Lord of mercy. How would the God that all of God's people would know the difference between W-O-R-K and W-O-R-D? Amen. In this context right here, it makes all the difference in the world. He has not committed unto us the work of reconciliation. That was God's work. And only God could do it. And only God does do it as his people comes along in time. Oh, but he is committed unto the church. He committed unto the apostles. He committed as the apostle Paul and as, as we were there in the, in the text uh, uh, where the apostle was writing to Timothy and, and telling him to, uh, to be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus, uh, telling him to be a good soldier of Christ. Uh, but also there in between is that verse uh, uh, that, that, that says, But of the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who, who will teach others also. Amen. And as you've heard me say before, you've got Jesus, you've got Paul, you've got Timothy, you've got faithful men and others. You've got five successions right there. And those others become faithful men and they, uh, they teach others. That's the w w word, W-O-R-D, of reconciliation. That's the ministry of uh, reconciliation. Uh, to tell and to preach that word and keep commitment uh, uh, unto uh, uh, faithful men uh, and they teach others. Uh, uh, that's the way it's come down through time uh, uh, over these past 2,000 years or so through the gospel church uh, that God uh, amen, has called and raised men up. Uh, he has illuminated their minds and hearts and showed them the truth as it is in Christ. Uh, amen. And he's had faithful men uh, uh, that he uh, has uh, in the, already in the past over their life taught them and others have been instrumental. You see there were some things that God showed me and I began to understand but when I came on and, and began to speaking uh, and hearing primitive Baptist elders preach and asking questions uh, more things started falling in place and, and I was able to connect uh, um, the dots together and put more pieces uh, of the puzzle together yeah. amen so you see that's the way it works 
Amen. Amen. That's the way it works. That's the way the Scriptures teach us that it works. So He's committed unto us this word of it, of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. What does an ambassador, one that represents a country, what does he do? There's an embassy. And uh, we have embassies in hostile countries. Yeah, we do. We have embassies there. We have ambassadors to even these hostile countries that go to these embassies. Are, what, what are they doing? They're not, they're not over there trying to uh, convert and uh, get those citizens of that country to become citizens of the United States. No. They're over there doing what? They're over there trying to seek out and trying to find and, to, and, and if there is uh, citizens already of the United States to bring them into the embassy to help them while they're in a hostile country. <laughs> I tell you, we're in a hostile world. That's against God and against His Christ. And I tell you, it's, it's the church, the gospel church, that's an embassy. We are ambassadors. And we're not trying to make children of God. We're trying to seek out and to find uh, with the Lord opening doors and showing us children of God that we can help them. Oh, uh, that we can endeavor uh, by some means to save some, as the Apostle Paul says. Uh, and that was uh, his intentions. Uh, not to, uh, to make children of God. The, when the Lord told Peter to feed my sheep and feed my lambs, uh, uh, he didn't say to make sheep and make lambs. I know we've heard that before, but it's still true. Amen. And I want to say it now, and I'll say it again sometime, uh, uh, most likely. Oh, uh, the Lord didn't tell him to make any sheep. You can't make sheep. Uh, amen. God's made sheep. Uh, uh, God made them for the foundation uh, uh, of the world. Uh, and uh, uh, his sheep went astray. Uh, uh, they were estranged right along with the goats. Uh, 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 there of the wicked, wicked uh, uh, because of what Adam did uh, where he sold us out. And, and even the sheep uh, had to be redeemed back and purchased back. Uh, 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 God... Uh, it's the maker of his people. Somebody said one time, where'd God get his people? He made them. Amen, he made them. God is the maker, amen, of his people. So he says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Where are you to be reconciled to God? In this verse, what's he talking about? You, you said, Brother David, I thought that uh, in, the, in the legal work of Christ and then in the vital work and regeneration, we are reconciled unto Christ. Yes, we are. But when he says, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. He's not trying to convince these folks that he's writing to to get saved for heaven and mortal glory, to be reconciled to God. Where is this recon reconciliation? It's in their mind. Yeah. It's in their mind for them to be reconciled in their mind. Oh, of what God has done. And he tells that in verse 20, 21. This is what they're to get reconciled to. This is what they're to get lined up with. You know, that's a simple definition for reconcile. It's a realignment. It's a readjustment, if you please. God's, you see, God's people got out of line through Adam's sin. All of them, all of the posterity through Adam got out of line, got out of adjustment, dead in trespassing sin. But be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's if God's people can get lined up in their mind what he's just said right there. Amen. Amen. Then you'd have the heart and mind getting together. But many of God's people, their, their, their ignorant mind concerning the scriptures override their heart. Amen. What the Lord has done in the heart. I've told you this before, and I'll just give this example here again. I've talked with individuals and be talking about free and sovereign grace, and they're doing like this. What's doing that? It's the heart. 
Amen. It's the Spirit of God. That's where they've been reconciled. That's where they've been lined up. It's in their heart. Christ in them, the hope of glory. And then you come along and you keep going. Then all of a sudden, when you keep and you fine tune it a little bit, it's not the it's uh-uh. What just kicked in? The head. The head now is overruling the heart, the knowledge they got in the head. <laughs> oh. And uh, because you see it's it, it's hard. You first first uh, uh, God's people have to be untaught in order to be taught uh, the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. I tell you, I believe that if you could get to an individual uh, that is mature and has cognitive thinking and they've never been born again and uh, God borns them again and you get to them before any of the religionists of this world could and you, and you begin to preach and to teach them sovereign grace they wouldn't have any hurdles. They wouldn't have any biases. They wouldn't have any prejudices. <laughs> and I, I think they'd just acknowledge it. And I think they'd say, well, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Yeah. Amen. So, we understand that the God of this world blinds the mind. We understand the biases and prejudices and the, the assaults that Satan brains and, and, and the hurdles and that which comes forth. You know, the Apostle Paul also, I know time's about gone, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 17, and I invite you to, to read this week 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and chapter 11, and you're going to really get into this I guess we've just preached an introduction this morning, but you're going to get into this about boasting and, and glory and so forth and what the Apostle Paul talks about and uh, the situation at the church at Corinth. You see, there were, there were false apostles there and they were questioning the people of Corinth and getting them to doubt the Apostle Paul's apostleship. And that's why in... 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13 that Paul said, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So they were there and they were trying to damage Paul. And, and Paul was struggling with this of where it was needful for him to commend himself unto them and, and to show forth his apostleship it was needful, but yet he didn't want to. He didn't want to glory in his qualifications. And so, read Second Corinthians chapter ten and chapter eleven. But in verse seventeen of Second Corinthians ten, he says, "But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord." There, see, here you have this expression again, even when he writes to them in Second Corinthians. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I think we will just go ahead and stop right there because if I start in there, we'd have to go, th we'd need 30 minutes. And so we won't do it. Lord bless you. Let's select a song.